Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's event, Social Media Policy and Peace of Mind, How Fremont, California Protects Both with Automated Archiving. My name is Morgan Wright. I'm a senior fellow here for Government Technology. And look, folks, we got a lot of stuff going on today, so I'm going to dive right in. But first of all, I want to say thank you for joining us. The 60 minutes will be well spent, and we're glad you're spending it with us. Before we begin, just a couple of brief housekeeping notes. Um, you can, you can, uh, we're making a recording of this presentation available within 48 hours. So in case you uh, have any questions about whether or not you'll be able to see this again, in case you need to leave early or you want to share it with your friends, absolutely 48 hours from now, we will give you a link to this recording. It's interactive. We have a Q&A box down at the bottom of your browser there in the On24 platform. Make sure you hit that Q&A box. Send us questions. We love the questions, and we want to make sure that we can get to as many as we can. So make sure that you send it to us all throughout the presentation. If you want to download a PDF of the slides, no problem. Just click Webinar Resources. There's a widget there. You'll be able to do that. Also, use hashtag GovTechLive across your favorite social media platform and let people know you're learning something during this 60 minutes. Now, at the close of the webinar, we're going to have a brief survey. Please fill that out. Uh, it's very important. We've actually made improvements based on suggestions from you, um, you know, our listeners and our readers who uh, read this stuff afterwards. So make sure you complete the survey even if you can't stay. You know, at this time, we just uh, recommend you disable your pop-up blockers if you're experiencing any media issues. We've got Cortez and our crack staff from ON24. Uh, they'll be there to make sure that they can help you. We also have a help guide down at the bottom. Just click Help. So, hey, folks, let's get to the fun stuff. So joining me today is going to be Cheryl Golden. She's the Communication Manager for the City of Fremont, California, and Anil Chavla. He's the founder and CEO for Archive Social. Now, what we're going to do is I'm going to do just a quick intro called Social Media by the Numbers. We're going to get to Cheryl's piece called Social Media Policy and Peace of Mind, two things you need to have. And then Anil's going to come on and talk about the legal aspects of social media. So real quickly for me, just social media by the numbers. And, folks, there's only three numbers that matter. Yep, one, two, and three. Let's talk about the first one really quick. First one is the First Amendment. This is the most one of the most important issues and one of the things we find um, in our surveys with governments and the work that Anil has done, and I'm sure Cheryl will tell you about too, the First Amendment freedom of speech on a social media platform is a very challenging issue. Can you limit free speech? Can you limit certain types of speech? You know, those are all of these issues that we're going to be talking about today. Second number, the number two, right? This almost sounds like Sesame Street, right? Well, there's two things in here that during our surveys, uh, we do that biannually uh, with the Center for Digital Government and eRepublic Government Technology. We survey states. We found two key issues almost across the board no matter what we're talking about. The first one is transparency. People want governments to be transparent. They want to know that they have access to information, that when they make a request, they can see what's going on. They want to see the business of government when they make these requests, so the ability to be transparent, and social media provides a unique avenue into that transparency because it's a direct medium to your constituents. Second thing is they want accountability. They want to know that they can hold people accountable for good, for bad, or somewhere in between. They want to know that when decisions are made, they want to know who made those decisions. What are the records of those decisions? Where's our money being spent? So transparency and accountability, obviously two important things here. Third one, and this is something um, they used to call it people, process, and technology. I think that's outdated. So I've come up with a, a different approach. And I say I think there's three things we have here, no matter what you're looking at. First thing you have to do is think about policy. What is the outcome you want? I spent 18 years in law enforcement, a lot of work out here in Northern Virginia, in the defense, intelligence, the justice community. Folks, I'm telling you, they killed more trees than anybody because they wrote a lot of policy. But having policy is important. You have to know what your outcomes that you want. What is it you want? First thing you've got to do is put it into policy. Second thing you need to do is training. There's training dog, but training is like bathing. Neither one is permanent, and you can usually tell when it hasn't been done for a while. So not, you just don't write the policy, right? You have to train people on the behaviors that you want based on that policy. And then the third thing is once you get the policy and training down, then you get access to the technology. The F-117 is affectionately known as the Frisbee. Um, but uh, I can guarantee you no pilot gets in that thing unless they spent <laughs> hours and months of policy going through paperwork, going through the training. Then they go through the simulators, the trainings, the behaviors they want. Only then you get to the actual neat stuff, which is the technology. And just in case you're wondering, are there social media fails, you know, and how often do they happen? They happen quite a bit, folks. Here's your security tip of the day. If you're establishing a Twitter account, the last thing you do is you do not put your username and password in your Twitter message that you send out. That's how to fail at social media. Well, we know one person that's not going to fail 
at social media today, and that's going to be Cheryl Golden. She's the communications manager for the city of Fremont, California. Now, before I introduce Cheryl, we have our first poll question of today. Here's the question. What is your opinion on social media as a public record? Do you think it is definitely a public record by law? It might be a record, but our activity is not worth retaining. Do you feel strongly it is not a public record, or you don't know? So it's definitely a public record by law. Might be a record, but your activity is not worth retaining. You feel strongly it is not a public record, or you don't know. And while you're answering that, let me tell you a little bit about Cheryl. Uh, she is the communications manager for the city of Fremont, California. By the way, folks, home of one of the big Tesla plants. We will be giving away a Tesla at the end of this. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, we actually tried to get one from her. Now, with public and private sector experience in communications, public affairs, and community relations, Cheryl is responsible for oversight and management of the city's communication and public outreach efforts, including things like the newsletters, the websites, the brochures, news releases, fact sheets, folks, speeches, presentations, and the city's municipal cable channel programming. She also oversees the city's award-winning, and it is award-winning, social media program consisting of 25 social networking accounts on various platforms as well as the city's online citizen forum called Fremont Open City Hall. Again, folks, goes back to that transparency and accountability people want. So let's take a look at the results here real quick. So 65% of you say it's definitely a public record by law. A little over 7% say it might be a record but not worth retaining. Uh, almost 4% think of you, you think it's a public record, and about 24% of you, you're not sure. So those are some interesting stats. And Cheryl, of course, I was just kidding about giving away the Tesla. You're not going to give one away, are you? Unfortunately, we're not able to today, but perhaps the next call we can work on that. All right. Well, look, the floor is yours. All right. Thanks, Morgan, and good morning, everyone. Um, I wanted to first start out, in case you're not familiar with Fremont. We're in Northern California, and we're actually part of Silicon Valley. We're the fourth largest city here in the Bay Area, and our population has 232,000, and our city spans 90 square miles. Uh, we're also a lean city. We have one of the lowest employee staffing ratios per 1,000 residents here in the Bay Area. So in Fremont, we actually see social media and online engagement as an effective way to encourage our community engagement and further our city's message. And our program has definitely grown over time. It started with relatively no cost, where it was simply our staff time, and now it's much more comprehensive. We include a budget for some of our social platforms, and we have dedicated advertising dollars and promotional dollars. But really, at the end of the day, Social media is just one more tool in our city's communication toolkit. It really does complement what we're already doing. So today, let me walk you through how Fremont uses and has embraced social media and online engagement one small step at a time. So it wasn't easy for us to get started. We actually spent two years talking about social media before we launched our official program in November of 2011. And part of why it took so long for us to get to yes was the fact that we really were just comfortable with one-way conversation. And I don't know if you remember back then, but Facebook actually had a um, – back in the beginning, you could turn off the comments. Of course, that went away. Um, but we liked one-way conversation. But in November, or excuse me, May of 2011, our city manager actually said yes. He wanted us to launch Facebook, two-way communication and all. But for us, the unexpected ticker was – he actually wanted us to mul uh, launch multiple city Facebook pages in addition to the main one. He wanted five city department Facebook pages to be exact. So that's what he green-lighted. And then in June of 2011, we formed a social media team. We began developing our social media pilot program. So we actually called it a pilot program in the beginning because we thought if it didn't work out, we could actually scrap it. Didn't want that to happen, of course. Um, our team was charged with making sure our city covered all of its bases and didn't become an example to other agencies of what not to do with social media. So this next slide shows the five departments that were uh, part of our pilot program. Each of the yellow ones had their own Facebook page to pilot. From the beginning, we also had our attorney's office, human resources, and IT involved because they, since our group was tasked with creating a policy, developing policy, we wanted them to be part of shaping the program. So that initial team, we met for five months to develop our social media strategies and policies, and then also we wanted to determine which best practices to implement for our city. 
Um, today, our city social team, which by the way is what we call it, we're the city social team, it includes staff from all the departments noted here on the slide. We meet monthly and we touch base about our social program and how we can better support one another through cross-promoting um, and posting. We also talk about different policy things, technical issues that we're experiencing, um, any platform uh, changes that we've heard about that are coming, and training opportunities. We, we try to really uh, work together as a team. And Fremont's social presence has actually grown to 26 channels. I know in my bio it said 25, so we've since added one. Uh, we have 10 Facebook pages, five Twitter accounts, four Instagram streams, two YouTube channels, one LinkedIn, Google Plus, and Pinterest account, but we also have a blog and we have an online citizen forum, something we call Fremont Open City Hall. So if it sounds like a lot, it, it is, but it's a lot of fun and um, we really enjoy being part of the team, the social team. For us on Facebook, branding is really important. Um, our social media program, we want to make sure when people are visiting one of our pages, they're, they know they're part of the Fremont, California suite. So on all of the profile timeline pictures on Facebook, you'll see the City of Fremont logo if you click through on the image on any of our pages, and that takes you to the City of Fremont, California logo. And that's because there's uh, at least seven Fremonts across the country, so we want everyone to know uh, what state they're in when they're looking at one of our pages. Um, also, if any of our departments have their Twitter or Instagram or YouTube, LinkedIn or Google Plus pages, Whatever logo they're using on their Facebook page matches on one of those. And as far as protecting the city, our original team was definitely charged with crafting all the policies for social media, but also determining how we deal with archiving posts and comments. We also wanted to keep things legal, so we made sure we wanted to ensure that our mayor and our council members didn't violate the Brown Act by participating in online forums. So first let me talk about policies. We've reviewed a lot of different policies from other cities and we really just implemented what made sense for our city because it was important to us to have something in place before we actually got out there posting anything. So in total, we've We've since developed a social media use policy and standards for Facebook, Twitter, video posting and streaming, Instagram, Pinterest, and we've also established standards for new social media platforms. So our social media comment policy, it's actually viewable on all of our Facebook pages in the About section. And you can see it circled there on the slide. Um, it lets people know that the city reserves the right to remove comments if they violate any items we list, such as profanity, political in nature, advertising a business or product, etc. Also on the online citizen forum that I had mentioned, we have a similar comment policy posted. And we also post the uh, comment policy on our city website. And we include uh, the website link on all of our social profiles so people can find it easily. Uh, one other noteworthy item about our policy is it states that we monitor our pages during business hours only. And that's really just to manage the expectations of the public, but also to be mindful of our staff time. So since rolling out our program back in 2011, uh, we've updated our policy two times, and that's working in hand in hand with our city attorney's office. Uh, the first time we updated it was to address developing standards for new platforms that we wanted to try. Those were Instagram and Pinterest. And then also uh, to address live streaming platforms such as Periscope and Facebook Live. Then we also changed our policy to allow posting photos of elected officials. Um, that's because when we first launched our program, we actually couldn't post any photos of our city council. And over time, that really did prove to be a missed opportunity. So we couldn't, we couldn't use photos of them conducting official city business like out ribbon cuttings and groundbreakings. So uh, we needed to change that. I work with the city attorney's office so that we can find that middle ground that we could all live with. Um, they wanted to make sure, the attorney's office, that we weren't using our platforms to promote or advocate for a candidate or a measure or an initiative during election time, which we're in right now here in with our municipality. Um, so for us, I would say the biggest takeaway around policies 
is that they really take a lot of energy and time to craft and to get approved within our organization. So recognizing that social networking continues to evolve and that new platforms are constantly being rolled out, we hear about them every day, uh, we develop some general standards that cover us for new platforms that we may want to add to our social toolkit. Uh, that way, uh, we don't have to revise our policy every time we want to try something new. And we're definitely hoping that that streamlines our efforts moving forward with policies for social media. Uh, throughout the process, like I said, I worked hand-in-hand -hand with the attorney's office. We always had a strong partnership, um, always needing to be mindful of legal issues that could come up. So from the start, we also uh, had to deal with how to um, manage public record requests and retention for social media. So after research in the beginning and final input from our attorney's office, we did make a decision to manually capture the comments that were removed if they violated our social media uh, comment policy. So we, relied on, we also then relied on the social media platforms themselves for archiving all the posts and the comments that, that people had put up there. So what I would do is keep a screenshot of the Word doc in a Word document that included the original post, the comment removed, and then why it was removed. And then we'd use the social platform for archiving other posts and comments. So since November of 2011 when we launched, we've only taken down around 100 comments. And those have mainly been for advertising a business or product, being political in nature, promoting discrimination, or just being completely off topic for anything in our city. But as our program grew and our engagement really began to skyrocket, especially on our police department channels, we knew it could take a lot of time, a lot of staff time to go through each of the platforms manually to pull information for a public record request. So that's when we decided we wanted to explore an automated system. So we'd have just one place to go to get all the information. So we pulled together an internal team, because in Fremont we actually really love working on teams. Um, so we pulled in IT, the attorney's office, the city manager's office, and our police department, and we demoed multiple solutions on the market so that we can determine the best fit for our city. Because um, there really are a lot of platforms that are out there and solutions. They all have varied degree of sophistication and cost. Uh, but in December of 2015, that's when we selected Archive Social Solution. So that's what we have in place today to respond to public record requests. Um, the system captures 24 of our social channels for messaging, posted comments, likes, and shares. In fact, we treat those um, as press releases and correspondence, and we retain them for two years as part of the city's records retention policy. We're also following state law, and that's specific to government section code 34090, ensuring such records are available. We have a lot of staff that's part of our social team um, and posting to our channels. So for me, I like to know that we have a platform, and they're all tied into this one solution. And at any given time, we can quickly run a report and record everything that's been posted. So th this is what definitely gives our organization peace of mind. Uh, from the start, we wanted to make sure that we didn't violate anyone's freedom of speech on social media. Our attorney's office also wanted to make sure we didn't violate the Brown Act. So this is how we dealt with that. Our city attorney and our city manager let our council know that we were embracing, as a city, online engagement, first through social media and then through our um, citizen forum. So our council loved the idea of us being social. During those conversations and the briefings, our attorney also advised them not to comment on the various platforms that the city had because it actually could be a violation of the Brown Act, depending upon how many council members posted something. So to be safe, the message was just remain neutral and don't post comments. So, so far, so good. Luckily, that hasn't created a buzz for our city because we really want our buzz to be created through our great marketing efforts and our quality content that we post. And I think we all know, everyone on the phone, that social media really is an ever-changing landscape. And for us, we've learned a lot from our followers over the time. So over the next few days, or few slides, let me share some of our noteworthy experiences with you. So from the beginning, um, we knew that the residents were excited to to engage with the city in kind of a way that was convenient for them. We made it convenient. So from the start, we spent time developing our social persona, something that carries through on all of our channels no matter who's posting. We have an approachable voice, 
we're professional, and we're also friendly. So here's a post about visiting our booth at a local festival. Someone asked if we'd address traffic issues in our city at the booth, and that's a big issue going on in Fremont right now with traffic. So we replied by, sure, stop on by and chat with our staff. So this particular person was appreciative with that exchange. Uh, with social networking, you definitely want people to find your posts newsworthy and useful and share them with their networks. So this one is playing on the Pokemon Go craze. Um, it was highly successful as far as engagement for us, and it tied into one of our traffic safety initiatives. So we had already planned to add the look stenciling and some of our high traffic crosswalks to encourage people to look before they cross the street. But in a few of our select intersections, we actually got a little crazy and creative and painted pokeballs for the O's. We reached over 28,000 people with this post and over 13,000 views of the slideshow um, was posted. And then just to add to it, we asked our police department, hey, could you promote, cross promote this on your page? So while it definitely boosted our engagement even further, it turned into an interesting dialogue between two residents. And this is what happened. Someone posted comments on the city's post yet they were actually on the PD shared post. So this person thought that someone had removed his comments because he couldn't see them on the PD page. So our staff from PD contacted me. We made sure that neither one of us had accidentally removed a comment for some reason. Um, we didn't. And so the police department uh, put out their official comment that no one had removed his comments. So then what happened is a resident piped in and she said uh, that something had changed and the reason why you're not seeing them is that Facebook had changed their platform. So I think this is a really good example of a platform changing how it displays something, and in this case it's the comments, without letting its users know. So we, d we do our best to stay on top of platform changes, but sometimes they just sneak up on all of us, and I think you probably have experienced that as well. Um, so here's a couple other posts. Uh, this one happens to be about an officer-involved shooting that occurred in our city this past June. The one on the left is the police department's initial post about the incident, letting the community know what happened. So a high-profile incident like this really can happen in any city. So for us, the police department took to social media and they kept the community informed. And because we have a great community police partnership, the comments we received on these posts, as well as the hundreds of other comments and related posts, they were nearly all positive. Not one comment violated our policy and we didn't have to remove a single one. But I share this example because I want you to know that the sheer volume of comments you can receive on any given post, they need to all be monitored to ensure that they don't violate your post. You never quite know what could go viral. And just to let you know, today both officers are recovering from their injuries. So despite all of this, sometimes you just need to have a thick skin with social media because the comments become downright nasty and ugly. So here's an example of our, in our city of an 80-pound Akita dog that was bit by two people. It became a public safety issue for everyone. So the owner willingly turned over the dog to our animal shelter and signed the paperwork for it to be euthanized. The next thing you know it, an Akita rescue group learned about this and they wanted to rescue the dog. So the city said no and it went to court. And then the judge sided with the city and the dog was euthanized on a Saturday morning. But after that, the city's Facebook page lit up with misinformation about the issue and lots of name calling for our city. We were no longer the city of Fremont, we were the city of murderers. And I'll tell you, it was really tough. It was a dark time for us. It felt like we lost control because people were commenting throughout our pages on unrelated posts, but we really didn't lose control. We chose to leave all the comments up even though technically they violated our commenting policy. But we knew that this was a heated topic that happened in our city, and we really felt that if we took anything down, more harm would be done than good. The so one noteworthy point I want to make is that most of the people commenting were not our residents. They were from all over the country, and they learned about the issue on social media. So just know that anything can go viral at any time. So how we handled it, we completely went dark and we waited two weeks before posting anything on our page, really hoping things would settle down, and then they finally did. So to wrap things up, um, like any new adventure, there are growing pains, there's course corrections, and of course there's lessons to be learned. So here's just a few quick takeaways um, that we've learned. Just remember to have a thick skin. Comments aren't always warm and fuzzy. 
and you have to remain strong and committed to your ultimate goal, which really is engaging with your community. So don't get discouraged when you have to leave those negative comments up about your agency or a possible policy decision that was recently adopted. Another lesson is that social media really is like a living and breathing thing. You, you may post or tweet something and not realize there's a backstory to that subject. Had you known, perhaps you wouldn't have drawn attention to it out there on social media. Also, you have to pay special attention to local, national, and international news. You have to decide if it makes sense for your agency to weigh in or just to go completely dark out of respect for what's happening around you. And for us, given the size of our team, we can have anywhere from 12 people posting on any given day. Um, moving from that manual way of um, archiving comments to something that's more automated definitely will eliminate staff time for public record requests. We won't have to spend time going to the original platforms to find comments and posts. So really, I'm thrilled that Fremont has embraced social media um, wholeheartedly. We have a solid policy in place to guide our efforts, and we also have support from the top down. And we're just going to continue fine-tuning our tools and the apps that we use uh, so we can make a difference with our community. So I thank you for your time today. My contact information is up on the last slide, so feel free to reach out to me after the Q&A if you don't get your question answered. So now, Morgan, I'll toss it back to you. Cheryl, thank you so much. And uh, one of our folks out there, Carrie Willis. So, Carrie, there's your chance to grab uh, Cheryl's uh, email address, and you can email her about your question there. So thank you very much. Hey, folks, moving right along, we're going to get to this next part here. It's my honor to talk to you about Anil Chavala. Anil is the founder and CEO of Archive Social. But before I give you his full background, we have one more question for you folks here. So let's get to that one here real quick. How is your agency currently retaining records of social media? So we're not retaining our own records and require, uh, rely on the networks. We take manual captures like screenshots, copy and paste. We use a personal backup tool like Backupify, SocialSafe, etc. You use an automated solution for archiving or you are already a happy archive social customer. You're not retaining your own uh, records and you rely on the networks. You take manual captures, a personal backup tool, automated solutions, or you're already an archive social customer. And while you guys are filling that part out, let me tell you a little bit about Anil. Neil is the founder and CEO of Archive Social. It is the public sector's leading provider of technology to help government agencies. They archive and manage risk related to social media. Now, Archive Social partnered with the state of North Carolina in 2010 to launch the world's first open and interactive archive of social media. And since then, Archive Social has enabled hundreds of government entities, ranging from West Covina to Menlo Park in California to the world's largest law firm, the U.S. Department of Justice, maintain records of social media for legal protection and public records requirements. Now, the company was selected for the prestigious Code for America Accelerator in 2013, recognized in 2014 as a cool vendor in government by leading analyst firm Gartner, and honored as a GovTech 100 company earlier this year by Government Technology Magazine. And Neil's also the co-host of the GovTech well, Social Podcast, GovTech and I've had, the honor, I've had the honor of being on there with him. So now let's take a look at the quick poll results here. So uh, real quickly, 61% not retaining your records relying on the networks. 25% you take manual captures, of which Cheryl said that, the, that that's one of the things they were doing earlier. Use a personal backup tool. Use an automated solution. That's 4.5%. Or 6% of you, almost 7% are already happy archive social. So, Neil, boy, 61% just relying on the networks. I know you've got some insight on that. Morgan, absolutely. I'm very happy to, to address uh, many of the issues that are raised here today. And, and on the flip side of that, really excited to see that about 40% of you have taken some type of action to, to institute record keeping and protect the data on your social networks. Um, before I jump in, I want to just say thank you to Cheryl uh, for her participation in, in this presentation. Uh, I've done a lot of these across the country, and I found this uh, extremely instructive in terms of how you think about your social media presence what are the issues to address? And so I really appreciate hearing that end-to-end -end story as well as the specific examples. And one, one key takeaway for me is that uh, time and time again, we come across this. You don't have to roll this yourself. Uh, you know, not only can you be collaborative internally, um, as they have been uh, in Fremont, but also looking at other agencies, policies, and, and examining what's out there because there are many of these issues that have been addressed and solved. And um, in fact, being a part of this presentation today is exactly along those lines of learning from each other. So that's where I will take it, uh, and what I want to do is step back and address that first poll question where about, uh, I think about 30, 35% of you uh, were unsure about social media as a record, either unsure or um, just felt that it wasn't a record. And so I'm going to spend a little bit of time diving into some other examples 
around social media usage in government, and when social media does constitute a record, uh, and, and, and then really lay the case for why you should be thinking about this issue right now. Uh, and then in terms of going from a manual process, uh, for, for many of you who are, who are screenshotting, to an automated process, uh, that, is, that is really what you want to do long term. There are a lot of, uh, a lot of pitfalls with the manual process that we, can, we will bring up here, but I want to give you guys some guidance on how to think about archiving. In full disclosure, my company, Archive Social, archives social media, but there are other vendors out there. And so what I want to do today is give you some more high-level guidance on how to think about this issue of social media as a record and how to keep records of it uh, in an automated fashion for those of you who are able to move from either no archiving or screenshotting to more automated processes over time. And of course, we're here to answer your questions, so I'll try to get through my, my talk here in the next 20 minutes and leave plenty of time for us. Now, before we talk about the examples and the solutions to, to the record keeping challenge, we should just stop and, and take a second and say, why is this so important? And fundamentally, it does start with your public records law. I know a lot of you that have tuned in today are from the state of California, so I'll use California as an example. But every state in the United States has a public records law. Uh, in California, this is some of the verbiage out of the records law. In fact, this is the definition of, of what a public record is or what public records are. And You'll see this phrase that's very common in, in practically every public records law in the United States, which is that regardless of physical form, this information relating to the conduct of, of, of a public business constitutes a record. And if you think about that phrase, this is a very forward-thinking phrase because this law is old. This is not a law that was recently written. It was written decades ago, prior to email, prior to social media. But just like documents on paper can be a record, just like email can be public records, so can social media. And a great example there is if you receive a crime tip or a citizen complaint. It doesn't really matter if that information comes across via email or on paper or via a Twitter direct message. A crime tip is a crime tip, a complaint is a complaint. And you have to think about how that fits into your existing laws, such as the Records Act, as well as your local retention schedules. Some further guidance also exists in California. So this is actually out of October of last year. This is information that started as guidance uh, out of CalRIM, the Records Information Management program there in California. Uh, again, this is information for uh, local entities, not just the state departments, but also local entities around record keeping and, and actually uh, was formalized into the e-records guidebook late last year, uh, talking about when social media does generate public records uh, at a high level. And then in, in the event that social media generates public records, we'll see it, it does in many, many cases, uh, you must have a plan to export records from a social media site. So not only is it a good idea, but this is really a requirement uh, in California and many, many other states across the country. So when does social media constitute a record? You should definitely check out the, the e-records book there. But I want to give you some examples that I think uh, will we'll simply just make sense. When you look at this, uh, you'll understand very clearly that social media generates records. And for those of you who aren't quite sure uh, when this is happening, this is a good time to reflect on your own social media presence to see if there's any crossover where you've had examples like these. Now, this very first example, I hope that no one's ever had a situation like this. This is um, somewhat of a, a raw situation still with, with the, the worst mass shooting in the history of the United States um, just a few months ago in Orlando. But I, I want to highlight this because this situation has a, a little bit of a silver lining in terms of how, how valuable social media can be in times of crisis. And in the middle of the night when the shooting unfolded, the Orlando police made a very wise decision to utilize Twitter as the primary channel for disseminating information. They said no emails or phone calls were using Twitter feed. And that really speaks to the value of social media and the importance of, of the work that all of you have done to establish social media profiles and attend sessions like this to help develop your social media strategy. And this is a massive, massive crisis, a massive emergency, but there are uh, different types of emergencies and crisis situations of, at, at every size and level across the nation. And social media really does prove its value in those situations in terms of getting information out, allowing your audience to amplify that critical information, which can truly save lives. Uh, and so in all the circumstances, whether it's a, a flood or a thunderstorm to, to a shooting, uh, to anything else, social media is generating records um, that, that are worth keeping uh, because you're able to use it for, for critical information. Now, as we go around these examples, I'll, I'll touch in, in detail on one more here, which uh, really speaks to the fact that not only does this relate to crisis situations in the real world, but sometimes crisis situations can come out of the online world. In, in this case, this is South Florida, uh, city, of, city of South Daytona in Florida, where a photo was posted with a dog's mouth being duct taped. 
and it caused quite a controversy and stir online. Um, and the woman who posted it actually t tagged the city of South Daytona, even though she didn't live there, that was tagged in her Facebook post. And so there was an outrage, uh, a group of citizens that, that reached out to the city demanding that this animal cruelty was, was taken care of. And so this small town of 10,000 population was overwhelmed with thousands upon thousands of comments, 24,000 comments, in fact, in a, in a matter of days on their Facebook page. Uh, and it really overwhelmed the communication staff. It also led to a significant number of records requests from media, not only the local media, but national media. And so again, something online can even turn into a crisis situation uh, relating to your presence. And, and if you, you can check out the case study on this, South Daytona did a masterful job of, of informing citizens, keeping them updated, and helping to track this person down across the country to, to address the animal cruelty. So another example. Now, it doesn't have to be this, this type of uh, outrageous situation or a crisis situation. Day-to-day -day things happen, and in my hometown, Sid Durham, North Carolina, where Archive Social is located, uh, 911 went down for a brief period, and, and Twitter was really the only way to inform citizens. And then, and really the final defining example for all of you to think about on your social media presence is that ultimately social media exists to provide a communications channel that's two-way, as Cheryl mentioned, with, with, with your citizens. And that leads to questions and comments coming in that you need to address or you should address. And it really is about serving your citizens. Every agency on social media, fundamentally, if you're involved with social media um, to any degree, if you're not just blasting, but you're actually having a conversation, you are serving your citizens in some way. And because social media touches every aspect of what your, what your agency does, these days, you're likely to get questions and complaints and other information that um, will constitute records. So here's an example from Austin where somebody reported uh, grass that had not been mowed on a sidewalk. And uh, the Austin Code Department actually responded back on Facebook asking for a photo and, and, and gave updates. And that's that service that happens each and every day. And, but when you put that against your record retention schedules, these are real records that are worth keeping. Hopefully nothing legal comes out of it, but they certainly can. And, and uh, you have to think about that, that interaction that you have, that two-way conversation. Now, moving on, maybe we're wondering, okay, well, this is all on Facebook and Twitter. We, in fact, saw that 65% of you um, are relying on the social network at this, at this moment to have the data for you. I'm going to address that in a bit more detail in a moment, but it is not as simple as, as simply uh, relying on those networks and expecting citizens to go there. And a perfect example is uh, out of Seattle from about two years ago now where a citizen went to the Twitter feeds from the police department, couldn't find the information he was looking for on the Twitter feeds. So we actually made a public records request for those Twitter feeds, uh, and Seattle PD had to, had to oblige by that. Now, Many of you, I'm guessing most of you, have not yet had a direct public records request or legal request for your social media content. Um, many, many agencies have, but most people probably haven't had that yet. However, if you look at the bottom of this slide, it's likely that you've seen a public records request framed uh, with this type of language. Any and all documents, all notifications of the street closure, all emails and communications. And again, because social media touches almost everything that you do in terms of how you communicate that to citizens, it's very likely that your social media pages and profiles contain content that fall under these requests, especially notifications of the street closure, as we mentioned, with, with, with any kind of natural disaster or uh, information that needs to get out very quickly. So something worth thinking about is when have you had a request like this, and how much of your social media should have actually been a part of that request? So that gives you a high-level set of examples. Now, some of those examples were national news. Many of you have heard about those incidents. I also want to share a few examples from our customer base that you probably would have never heard about, but these examples really speak to the importance of being proactive. Why take action now versus reactively? Well, again, uh, you never know, and you'll never, you'll, you're never at risk until you're at risk. And so uh, and that's the unfortunate thing here, but we'll talk about how we can, make, we can help, help you be proactive and, and ensure that you have the record keeping in a very easy, cost-effective manner. And so these examples are about agencies that have done that uh, and, and why that was so helpful. So the first example I have here is out of San Marcos, Texas. As many of you know, Texas was uh, hit by really the worst flooding in the history of the state last year. Uh, and the first flood actually happened in, during Memorial Day weekend, where social media, again, played a critical role in the emergency, using it to get information out to the citizens efficiently, but also gather information from citizens regarding damage, regarding streets that have been flooded, uh, you know, any missing person type information. A lot of that was coming through their social networking channel. And so San Marcos, Texas had, had smartly employed archiving technology uh, just prior to these floods hitting. Uh, and they, the archive proved critical 
for the records requests that inevitably come in after a crisis like a flood. Not only is that, but they were able to then use the archived information to build a disaster timeline and review what had happened from the lens of social media. Again, social media provides a great perspective on what, what matters to your citizens. And they built a disaster timeline. They reported that internally. And six months later, they had another flood, unfortunately, but they were that much more prepared thanks to this information. And you can check out the government technology case study yeah, that's linked in this slide deck. We'll send this out. In California itself, the Santa Barbara PD, this is a really interesting example where the police department had thought about archiving, knew that this was a requirement, but didn't really feel like it was a priority for a long time. Uh, after several months of talking to a member of my team, they decided to start a free trial of Archive Social. And three weeks into that trial, they uh, actually received a public records request. And they received a request related to a gun buyback program. Again, this is a city initiative, but it is fairly controversial. And a lot of communication had happened back and forth on Facebook. And the public information request came in, and it came in from the National Rifle Association. So this is not a public records request that you either uh, you, you know, sort of work yourself around or, or, or that you, you loosely respond to. And of course, no one wants to do that, right? But, but, but the police department felt that if they didn't have an archive, they would have had a very loose response to that because they would have scrolled through page upon page, screenshotting um, the individual that was responsible this felt that like he really wouldn't have been able to do a good job responding to that request. Unfortunately, he had started that free trial uh, in a matter of minutes, could produce that information in a comprehensive, reliable fashion, get it to the NRA, and, and thankfully nothing came out of that situation. So really reducing the risk is what this is about so that you can continue to benefit from your social media presence. Now, the final example I have is out of Spokane, Washington. And I really uh, like to share this example, um, again, not to scare anyone from social media because social media is so critical to how you have a, a transparent co communication with, with your citizens, but really to highlight the fact that as a government agency, and, and based on the importance that you have to people's lives, that there is risk and the possibility of litigation as you've always had, uh, now it will just include your social media to some degree. And so with Spokane, they were using social media to promote local events, probably like every one of you do uh, on your social media sites, promote local events. And unfortunately, somebody died on a kayaking trip. And so the lawsuit for the plaintiff's family saw the city had used Facebook and other networks to share information about this kayaking trip, and they were concerned about the conditions under which this, this trip was approved to, to happen. They actually issued a request to the city as one of the, one of the folks in the lawsuit uh, requesting two years of Facebook content related to the kayaking trip. And again, if you read this case study from Government Technology, Washington has strict laws and public records uh, requ requests. Yeah, you have to respond very quickly or risk being fined. Uh, and in this case study, they talk about either not being able to respond or certainly not being able to respond in the time period allowed, allotted um, if they did not have archiving technology. So fortunately, they did have archive social in place and were able to respond and, and do that part of, of what they needed to do in the lawsuit uh, to protect the agency. So just a few examples where archiving, again, plays a role in protecting your city, 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 city and your citizens' uh, ability to receive information from you. So how do you go about archiving? Well, let's take a look at, at some, some fundamentals here. Now, before I talk about what to look out for, I do want to raise a bit of a red flag in terms of the social networks. Uh, and the key idea here is that Facebook and Twitter have made no guarantee to any government agency that they will retain your records per your requirements. Uh, that is not the business that they're in. Hopefully, your information will be there, but there's no guarantee. Uh, if you go to Facebook's law enforcement page, it says that you can issue a subpoena for information prior to that information being deleted. However, if it's been deleted, they may not be able to help you. So at Archive Social, we decided to conduct a study uh, and here in the month of January where we surveyed, uh, really sampled from our, with using our technology, 400 government agencies that, that we archive. And we ran this for the month, entire month of January to see how much content is actually being deleted or lost from Facebook. And we're able to do this because our archiving technology can actually de detect deletions. And as we ran the study to the end of January, we looked at it, and we ourselves, being an archiving company, were actually quite surprised by this. 7,800, nearly 7,800 communications deleted from Facebook in one month from, from the 400 customers. Now, not every customer had a deletion, but three out of four did. And when we looked at them, most of them had one or two deletions. Some of them had dozens of deletions. That's a lot of deletions, though, if you think about it, about 20 a customer in just one month. And when you, when you look at the content and you talk to these agencies, this is not something that, that everyone's aware of. These agencies did not knowingly delete this information. In fact, 
the vast majority of our customers just hide, they don't delete. What actually happens is that sometimes a staff member does delete even the policies not to delete because they made a mistake or for whatever reason they decided to remove something, but also the citizens will remove their comments and messages to you. And oftentimes the citizen comments have the most critical information, whether those are crime tips or anything else, they may just change the conversation by, by deleting what they said. So this is something to think about. This data is disappearing. In fact, on every, every almost three out of four Facebook pages, something uh, was lost in that one month, and we continue to see that as we monitor it. So what do you do? Well, you think about archiving. Uh, now, some of you are screenshotting today. Uh, there are challenges with that. It takes a lot of time to do it comprehensively. Uh, and the biggest question is, how do you search that? Uh, for many, many years of, of taking these screenshots, how would you really go back and piece it all together? Will that information be comprehensive? Will there be gaps? Probably because you're doing it manually. So I encourage you all to think about automated technology. Again, we are one option, but there are others. So let me give you some guidelines around automated technology. Uh, in Archive Social, when we set out to solve this problem for the government, as really the first company focused on this in, in public sector, we identified four factors uh, that were unique to social media, or at least these four factors as in a combination are unique to social media. And the first is frequency. This is perhaps the most unique because historically, emails and files, these are the types of information that you, you archive and have records. So your IT department can do that because all of that goes through your IT network. But with Facebook and Twitter, you can use a smartphone, you, uh, citizens can post back, and the information does not reside with your IT, it resides with Facebook.com and, and Twitter and these other social networks. You have to get this data in your control and you have to do it very frequently or you risk data loss. You want to be comprehensive because information is broadcast in public and it's likely that if there's a lawsuit or someone coming after you, they've kept some sort of records and it's in your interest to have more than less. And you want to think about not only what's, what you see on the page, so if you take a screenshot of Twitter, for example, that's not the whole story. A tweet has way more than 140 characters when you, think about the when you look at the electronic record because of all the what we call metadata. So you really need that electronic record. Authenticity is about having information that truly protects you in legal circumstances so that you can prove that, it's, that it is what it is. Nobody can challenge that screenshot of yours. You want a record that they can't challenge that will hold up in court. And context is about being able to piece it all together and make sense of it. And if you think about social media, it's quite complex. How do you piece together a Facebook conversation that happened three years ago with 300 comments on it that came, came in across two weeks? That's a really hard thing to do, especially when you think about all the photos and videos and, and other multimedia that, that could be involved in that conversation. So you want to look for a record-keeping approach and technology that takes care of that for you. So let's look at a few examples of, of all, of this, uh, all of these factors brought together. The first is if you look at your presence today and you're not archiving, you probably have lots of content on there that's been there since the day you started your, 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 your Facebook page or Twitter account many years ago. So you want to look for an archiving approach technology that can go back and get everything that's still available and provided by the social network. Um, what's lost is lost, but you, you don't want to start from scratch. Uh, and for trivia, I, I have included the original original homepage of Facebook thefacebook.com here. But uh, our archiving technology, for example, can go back to the, the inception of a Facebook page. In most cases, you want to look for technology that will go back and, and get your archive started for you. You also want to look for technology that will be comprehensive in regards to not only one type of content, but all the different types of content. Private messaging particularly is important. Uh, and then finally, frequency on this slide uh, is again, getting it as soon as you can. So look for technology out there that captures content uh, in, in real time or near real time to protect your agency from data loss. I mentioned metadata when I turned, talked about being comprehensive. So this is, this is a slide that really explains that. Again, 100, 126 character tweet here really has about 2,000 characters of metadata, information that describes the communication, who sent it, what time it was sent out, what device was used to send it, that kind of thing. That's the true electronic record that you're not going to get from screenshots. And in multiple states, that electronic data, that metadata, has been ruled as public record. So it's something that you want to be careful about and ensure that your record keeping approach gets all that metadata. The other thing I like to call out is that when it comes to archiving, it's not as simple as just grabbing Facebook and storing it somewhere or grabbing Twitter and storing it somewhere. There's a lot of complexity. Uh, and like anything, particularly in a legal circumstance, the devil is in the details. So you want to look for archiving technology that deals with the details. So for all, for all of you social media managers, a few examples here. On Facebook, it's not the, the saying that you grab a Facebook conversation can mean a lot of things. Do you grab just the text? Do you grab the photos and the videos? Do you grab the comments? In this example, do you grab the comments on top of comments? 
Not all archiving technology does that. So something will account for you grab comments as they come in, even if they come in, say, six months or a year later on that post. Are you able to grab multimedia again, not only on the post because the post has a photo, but even comments can have multimedia. And these are advancements that the social network keeps changing. As Cheryl called out, the platform keeps changing. And as the platform changes and as things like live streams, how are you, how are you capturing those records to ensure that you're comprehensive? That's something to think about with the details. Uh, and finally, an example here out of, out of Twitter is uh, a lot of times social, networks, uh, social networking communications have their own quirks. Uh, on Twitter, the quirk is that you have 140 characters and you have to use tiny URLs or short URLs. And those, those URLs that turn into owlies or bitlies, they actually lose a lot of information. They lose what was actually being referenced by the tweet. And so one example here is archiving technology that we have that will resolve what an owlie actually points to our bitly or tiny URL and give you a little bit more context so that you have a tweet that's all 10 words and a link. You really know what that tweet was about because it has the entire link in there. And oftentimes it is a link back to your website. Another key aspect here when we talk about context is uh, that not only should, you, should the post look like it does on the social network, that's nice, but it's not just about the look and feel, it's about the behavior. Can you replay that conversation? As I said, social media is a living, breathing conversation. It's very dynamic, has a lot of multimedia. So not only on Facebook, Facebook's a key example, but other networks like Instagram and Pinterest and YouTube, they all have comment threads. So can you really replay that conversation and turn that comment into the entire thread and make sense of it. Not only do you want to do that in the product, but ultimately when you have a records request or a legal situation, it's probably because you probably have the need to get that information out and share it with somebody. And so one best practice to look for is look for PDF. A lot of archiving technology comes from the financial services world where they love Excel. Putting, looking at a Facebook conversation with multimedia in Excel is, is, is a painful task, and it's uh, quite an impossible task to really make sense of. So look for PDF as the best practice. And then what I want to call out here, again, is that conversation. So you might do a keyword and date search for a specific topic related to that records request, and what you'll find is that some of the posts will match, some of the comments will match, some of the responses to private messages will match. And the simple thing to do in an archiving product is just to export whatever matched. But with social media, you really need the context in that conversation. So look for technology that rebuilds it, reconstructs it, and, and, and gives you the whole picture. Uh, in this case, you can see that this turned into a records request um, that one of our customers actually had uh, where it matched just a few comments, but the comments were on a much larger thread. And so on the left, you can see the, the two-page PDF that came out that includes all the context and highlights would actually match the search. And that's something that you can hand off to somebody and eliminate that back and forth or confusion uh, and really simplify your, your part in responding to that records request so that you can get back to managing your social presence. And then finally, one thing I want to mention is that oftentimes when it comes to archiving, a lot of folks turn to the IT department and records managers, and certainly those are important stakeholders in social media archiving. But what's different about social media is that it's managed by the communications team oftentimes or, or somebody in IT that has more of an outward fo focus in terms of communicating with the citizens. And so the person managing the social media presence that has, has the credentials to it will often be requested to play a role in that records request. Uh, so how, why not make that archive work for more than just records requests? Let's make it work for communications in general. And so I want to talk, just mention to all of you that that the, the technology now exists to not only archive and capture this content, but really help you enforce your social media policy and help you analyze what's happening. Uh, so an example here is that you can set up alerting, for example, uh, on an archive, social archive, where you, you can receive alerts for anything that may violate your social media policy. Again, other technology may be out there to do this, but think about how this data can be multi-purpose, not just for compliance and record keeping, but for communication. You want to be able to get this information in a manner that you can use it and ultimately be able to report on it and, and leverage that archive data potentially for sharing, again, a disaster timeline like San Marcos did, or for sharing conversations that are worth exploring further in terms of how that may impact your policies internally or, or city programs. So again, that data has a lot of value. Just want to mention that, that we don't want to just, just sit in a locker until you have a legal situation, but let's, see, let's figure out how you can make use of it day to day. And finally, what I want to mention to all of you is I've mentioned, I've talked a bit about social, the risk around social media, public records requests, uh, legal situations, uh, and the importance to archive. Uh, one, one thing that, that I want to call out, though, at Archive Social, while we'd love to have your business, we also, also just want to be a resource to the public sector because we've built our business working with the public sector. 
And we have a pro bono, no, no cost initiative for folks that have not yet put an archive in place. If you encounter a crisis, whether that's a natural disaster, act of terrorism, a shooting, or anything like that, that overwhelms your staff and could lead to public records requests or legal situations, we will provide access to all of our technology at no cost, no obligation for 30 days. Uh, just go to this, this URL. It's our way of giving back and helping out because we know how important and critical social media is in times of crisis. And with that, here is my personal contact information. And back to Morgan for questions. Hey, Neil, thank you very much. As you guys see, we've packed a lot into this 60 minutes. Uh, take advantage of the e email. Take advantage of the resources that uh, Neil has provided. I'm telling you folks, it's worth the uh, money that you paid to attend. It's free, but trust me, it's worth twice as much as that. So, hey, folks, you know, we got some quick questions to get to here real quick. Just remember, uh, we will email a link out to everybody within 48 hours. If you refresh your browser at the bottom of it now, under Webinar Resources will be a download of the, uh, the slides in PDF format. So make sure you get that. So let's uh, hop in real quick uh, to a couple questions here. So Kerry Willis, City of Roner Park, asked, because uh, uh, Cheryl, you were talking about going dark for a couple weeks. What is the benefit of going dark for two weeks after your dog incident? Uh, can you just kind of elaborate on that a little bit more? Sure. Uh, for us, it really was if we started taking down the comments that violated our policy for whatever was being said on these posts, um, we felt that people would just become really mad and that they would continue bombarding that particular post and every other post that they were on, whether it was the city department, or the city's Facebook page, or any of our department pages. So that's why we did decide just to leave everything up. And that was after consulting with our city attorney and with our police chief at the time. So, you know, it's, it's nothing that you can make decisions sometimes on your own when you have something big staring at you, like extreme negative comments that are violating your policy on a lot of different levels. So uh, try, try to work with everyone within your organization, and that's what we did, and that was the decision that we made as an organization and how to handle it. So after that time, you know, the comments started dwindling, and then finally they did just stop related to that incident. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, again, transparency, it's still out there. Uh, tough thing to handle, especially on when you have tough comments like that. Hey, Anil, this one's actually for you from Samanji from Los Angeles County, asking if they sign up with Archive Social, do they do retroactive archiving, or does it start from the date you sign up? Uh, great question. I mentioned wanting to be comprehensive, and I had the screenshot of, of the Facebook.com from 2004. So that is something that we do provide in our technology. When you, when you add a social networking profiles for the archive, the first thing we do is go back to the beginning of time to get everything we possibly can. Uh, again, in most cases, that should be from the start of your Facebook page, uh, and that's just something that we do automatically as part of our, our, our product. Fantastic. Hey, um, and uh, Cheryl, this one's actually for you. Nicole Darling, San Diego Public Library. Um, you were mentioning how many staff that you had, and she's asking how many staff are dedicated just to social media? Actually, dedicated to social media, the answer is zero. So we don't have a position for social media. All of us that are working on it, the 12 to 15 staff members, it's, it's something that we're doing as part of our jobs to market or communicate what's happening in our departments. So no assigned staff. I'm hoping one day that can change. But as of right now, it's just something else that we're all taking on. Real quick, and here's one more for you. Then, Anil, I've got one for you. So um, we have um, Alma Flores, City of Santa Ana, asking, how many public records requests have you received involving your social media since you implemented Archive Social, and how many have you had before? So uh, on that particular, the answer is zero for both. So we haven't received a public record request um, before we – implemented Archive Social, and we haven't had one since. I, I think for us, just knowing that it's all automated now and that it's collecting the records that we need, uh, we were collecting them before, but now everything's kind of in one place on one platform. So we haven't yet had to use it other than running reports to just manage our program internally. And Cheryl, actually one quick follow-up to that, and thank goodness the two officers um, are safe out of that shooting. Like I said, I have two friends there on your city police department you and I talked about. Um, has there been a suspect arrested in that? Because that actually would be one of the areas where you would be pulling, right, social media records in case of a criminal investigation or a crime tip? Uh, the suspect actually is, no, has, is deceased. Okay. 
that answers that question. But again, that would be one of those uh, situations where you would have to pull it up. Not might not be a public records request, but would be you know in a trial. Um, hey, uh, Neil, this one's for you. It's from uh, Chris Skelly, South Tahoe Public Utilities. Does Archive Social allow us to monitor all of our social media profiles? It's a good question, you know, and, and I, I would love to, to dive to dig into further in terms of what uh, Chris means by the word monitor. Um, what we do is we archive and we capture the content, and then we do provide that technology that will actually alert, uh, analyze, and alert. It's, it's, it's a secondary offering that we have on top of the archive for customers that choose to go to that level, where we will look for com com comments and, and, and messages that may violate your policy uh, or that may be related to public safety that may be related to a citizen raising a question. Um, so we have a variety of alerting that allows you to monitor the presence uh, in, a, in a much more efficient manner so that you're not constantly staring at that feed. Um, that's the type of monitoring we provide, uh, which is a little bit different than the management tools like Hootsuite or Sprout Social. Hootsuite is one of our partners. So we're very complementary to the, those social media dashboards where you would monitor on an ongoing basis day to day. But what if you're looking for is content delivered to you that you care about, that is something that we do provide in our, in our, in, in our package. And folks, uh, thank you, Anil. Great answer, folks. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. We have a one-hour time commitment with our speakers. We've reached that hour. I apologize. We couldn't get to all the questions. We have quite a few still unanswered, but that just shows the significant interest in this topic. And I want to thank, first of all, our speaker today, Cheryl, uh, for joining us from City of Fremont and Anil Chavla. And a special thanks to our partner at Archive Social. Folks, we can't put these things on without the great support of our great partners out there. So what I want to do is bring this to a close. Uh, just remember, we'll send out a link to everybody within 48 hours. Um, we want to again thank Cheryl Golden, Neil Chavla, and Archive Social for this. And thank you, everybody. We look forward to seeing you soon on another government technology event. Thank you, everybody. Have a great afternoon.